ready now, Hans? Yet? All right. We're going to test the waters this morning. There you go. All right, old guys. Old guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody. Evening. What you think? Oh, you think the guys are on? Okay. <sighs> Left turn. <laughs> Glad to see everybody out this morning. I hope you had a wonderful week. Uh, we're going to worship God today in spirit and truth, no matter how many we have. Uh, no matter who's listening uh, this morning. But uh, we're going to worship Him in spirit and truth. So let's stand. Let's give God glory today as we worship Him. Father, I thank you so much for your Son and, Father, what He means to us. Father, today that we can gather free to worship in spirit and truth today because you're worthy. You're our God. You take care of all the needs. We love you. We thank you for everything that you've done for us, everything you've given to us. So, Father, uh, we just worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen.
actually to reflect on this past year and even though it has been worrisome at times, we still have so many blessings to be grateful for and thankful for. And I thank you for a country that recognizes a day of Thanksgiving when we can really reflect and, and give thanks for so many gifts and blessings that we have. Father, this morning as we continue this series, uh, please be with heaven and give his word strength and wisdom and boldness to make us see how you are in control. Father, thank you again for your son, Jesus Christ, who we have just set time aside to recognize for his sacrifice here on the cross for our sins. We thank you for our many blessings. We thank you for all things in his name. Amen. All right, Jonah Smith's class can be dismissed at this time. As they are leaving, just a little bit of an update. We do want to spend some time in special prayer. Uh, Bonnie Cavanaugh is at home. Uh, she's dealing with coronavirus. She says her breathing, uh, breathing issues, obviously, is the biggest issue she's facing. Uh, she does some breathing treatments at home. And she says she's very, very slowly uh, getting a little bit better with that. Uh, but Jim and Brenda both have the virus, and Jim especially is really having a tough time with it. And so uh, when he asked, uh, we would keep all of them in prayer. Also, your mother. Yes. Fractured her arm? My mom fell last night and uh, fractured her arm right below where the ball goes in the socket. It's not displaced. So she spent the night in the hospital. We'll probably... We don't know at this point okay. because she's right. probably will have to, to rehab. Do some rehab yeah. someplace. So, so vital barns, fracture, yeah, just below the shoulder. Break, or no, anything break. like that, no surgery, anything like that. It stabilizes it and then it has to be a long time. But mom is yes. 90 years old. Yeah, 90 years old. <laughs> so let's, uh, before we get into the message, uh, let's go ahead and uh, lift those folks in prayer and then we'll continue on. Father, we thank you for another day that you've given us. We just want to pause and lift up our, our brothers and sisters right now, especially with Bonnie and with Jim and Brenda. Father, as they battle this virus uh, to, to varying degrees, we ask that you would watch over them and give them strength and just help them to feel stronger and, Father, just to, to be able to get back on their feet again. And I know Bonnie especially misses Dan here, and uh, she's grateful for her church family, and I just pray that we can do whatever we can for her right now. Pray that you be with Violet, Father, that you help her mend quickly and fully, and just help her get back to her family and community and church family that loves her so much. We just thank you for your son. We thank you for your provision over our lives, and we just pray, Father, that you would uh, just continue to take care of these folks. Be with us as we open your word today and discuss this issue of complaining and envy and gratitude. Father, just help our, our minds to be open to your word, and Father, we just pray that that your word would penetrate every fiber and being of us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to turn in your Bible, uh, we'll be in the book of Numbers, a couple different chapters, but we'll start in chapter 11 here uh, fairly shortly. Uh, some of you will remember the words of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, which are often read around this time of year at Thanksgiving. Paul writes there, very simply, Be joyful always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So the New Testament repeatedly calls us to be people who are thankful and grateful. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. So to give thanks is not a helpful suggestion for a healthy life. It is a command in Scripture. Paul says this is God's will for your life. But we talked last week about how ingratitude is kind of a cultural epidemic in our culture today. We who have so, so many blessings in 21st century America, even Christians, we often fail to walk in God's will and to give thanks in all circumstances. And we talked last week about how maybe the biggest Thanksgiving thief of them all is none other than the green-eyed monster of envy. We talked about how envy comes into our life when there's something that we want, but we just don't have it yet. 
We want this kind of a house, and we're not content until we have it. We want this kind of degree of influence, and we're not content until we have it. We want recognition for something selfless that we've done, and we're not content until we receive it. We want this kind of income, and we're not content until we have it. And so it's hard for us sometimes to see envy within ourselves, but one of the telltale signs that we're envious people is when we have a propensity to complain and to criticize. We gripe and we nitpick and we frequently find fault. The more we do that, the more we reveal that envy is eating us up and that it's being a, thank, a thief of thanksgiving in our lives. So here's what that means. That means if giving thanks in all circumstances is God's will, then what is it when we don't give thanks in all circumstances? When we do not give thanks, when we aren't grateful, that means that is a sin. It's disobedience. And if it's disobedience, if it's sin, then it's something that we need to repent of. We need to repent of being ungrateful and for lacking thanks. And so you might hear this idea about ingratitude being a sin. And if you're like me, your initial thought upon hearing that is something along the lines of, okay, technically it's a sin, but this is a sin that God kind of winks at. Right? I mean, this is this is on the JV team of sins, right? This is not a varsity team sin to, to just complain and whine once in a while. It's really not that big of a deal. We might equate ingratitude with something like, you know, saying the word dang it or bad habit or something, some other Christian cuss word. God doesn't love it, but he understands that it's part of the human experience. And so we can kind of be dismissive of ingratitude. We can be dismissive of complaining. But we're going to see in the book of Numbers today that, that God takes this really, really seriously. So look with me in, in Numbers chapter 11. We're going to see an example here where God takes gratitude or the lack thereof very seriously. And probably all of you are familiar at least with some context of what's happening in Numbers chapter 11. The Israelites have been rescued from slavery in the land of Egypt. You remember how God delivered them with ten plagues and he split the waters of the Red Sea. And the original plan was for the Israelites to leave Egypt and to go to this land of Canaan, which was called a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, God had said. It's a chunk of land that God had set aside specifically for the people of Israel to establish themselves and to grow as a nation. But instead of this being the two or three week trip that it should have been to the promised land, the Israelites end up wandering. They end up making this trip a 40-year trip. 40 years. And the reason the trip took so long is not because the husbands who were in charge refused to stop and ask for direction. That's not why it was so long. God caused this to take 40 years because the Israelites who left Egypt as slaves very quickly became ungrateful. And that ingratitude was revealed most by frequent and constant complaining. All kinds of negativity, and there's this attitude of, I want this, I don't have this, so I'm going to write until I get it. And so these Israelite people, rather than immediately inheriting the land of Canaan, they wandered the wilderness for four decades. Only two adults who left Egypt as, as slaves would be able to enter the promised land. Even Moses, their leader was not permitted to enter the promised land. The reason is that they're constantly compl complaining and whining and being ungrateful. We see an example of this. Numbers chapter 11, starting in verse 4. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if we only had meat to eat. Remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost, and the cucumbers, and melons, and leeks, and onions, and garlic? But now we've lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna, they said. And so they're complaining about their food. And that's a common theme that you read about as, you, as you're studying this point in Israelite history. But this complaining stems from a craving that they had that had not been met yet. There's something that they want that they don't have, and it's envy is what it is. And that envy is evidenced by their griping. Now you will remember that when the people were hungry, initially, God had provided them manna from heaven for them to eat. The Israelites would wake up in the morning and there would be this 
flaky stuff on the ground that they would go out and gather up enough for that specific day, and this was manna from heaven. God provided this physical nourishment in the form of manna, and the people were initially grateful. But pretty soon it's manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for supper, manna for midnight snack, manna milkshakes, manna pie, manna pizza, manna flavored Doritos, and they're tired of manna, 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 manna. Manna, manna, manna. Let's all say that out loud together this morning. Manna, manna, manna. Say it loud. Manna, manna, manna. Now this time we're going to say it, but I'm not going to say it. I just want to hear you complain. Some of you have heard them all, okay? So when I count to three, you all just say manna, manna, manna. One, two, three. Manna, manna, manna. All right? Now we want to get real whiny. Okay, I'm going to jump back in here because I know how to be one, okay? This time we're going to say, manna, 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 okay? One, two, three. Manna, manna, manna. That was the people of Israel. They just were tired of this manna. And so we see here that the Israelites are not going to God with this struggle that they're dealing with. They're just whining about it. They're just complaining about it. And that's one of the things I want you to catch from this story about complaining, and it's this. Complaining is contagious. Complaining is contagious. The year 2020, we have talked a lot about sicknesses or diseases that are very contagious. Well, complaining is contagious. It's an infection, and it will spread from one person to another, and it will ultimately infect an entire community in no time. Did you catch the beginning of this, this uh, Numbers chapter 11, verse 4? It says, the rabble with them complain. Just a small group, initially. Just a select few. The Hebrew word translated rabble is the word aspesuf. And it literally means a promiscuous assemblage of people. So it's just a small group of people, initially. There weren't very many. But there were enough of them. They began to complain, and pretty soon, the entire community of people, numbering some two million, were complaining. And that's the way complaining works. Just one family member over Thanksgiving with a negative attitude, and it brings down the whole household. Just one or two employees have a bad attitude on the job, and they're always complaining, and pretty soon, everybody kind of has this negative spirit about them. Just a couple of church members complaining. And that could be an infection that can quickly spread. And it's as if the complainer is holding up this lens, a dark lens, and helping other people to look through it and say, yeah, I didn't notice that before. But let me point out to you how cold it is in here. It's so cold in here. And you hear people whine about that, and pretty soon you start feeling a little bit chilly. You sit down at the Thanksgiving table and you start to eat and everything was good until the person sitting next to you says, is it me or is this stuffing really kind of dry? And you didn't notice it tasted fine you just a few moments ago, but now it needs more gravy all of a sudden. It's that spirit of negativity that one person can initially bring up that will eventually bring everybody down. That's what happens with the people of Israel. There's a, a rabble, a group of people that become negative and whiny, and it starts to infect the whole community. That complaint is, is contagious, and it spreads throughout the entire nation of people. It started out as rabble, and it ends up being an entire nation. I was reading recently, a couple years ago, in the city of Chicago, there was this Chuck E. Cheese. Thirty adults were standing in line uh, with their kids, to redeem those tickets that you get when you play the games and to buy the, uh, to get the cheap toys, and to get the prizes. And these 30 adults who are standing in line get into a fist fight, okay? There's footage of this that you can look up, but it's an all out brawl. And the police actually had to be called to, to this Chuck E. Cheese and 17 adults went to jail that day from Chuck E. Cheese. A fight in Chuck E. Cheese, 17 adults, go to jail. And it started because one person started complaining about length of the line. And they complained, and another complained, and another complained, and another complained. It's because negativity, it's because complaining and whining is contagious. 
But you know the opposite of that is true too? Just as complaining is contagious, so is thanksgiving. So is gratitude. So is generosity. Some of you probably experienced that before. Compare the Chuck E. Cheese in Chicago to the Chick-fil-A in San Antonio, Texas, where a few years ago, 228 consecutive people went through the drive-thru and paid for each other's meals. You see what happened? Go to the drive-thru window, worker says, hey, person in front of you paid for your meal. And at that moment, you have a decision, are you going to allow the generosity to spread? And so you're going to be generous with the person behind you. And for 228 consecutive cars, it's just this domino effect. And you know number 229 is out there somewhere. Like, you know, who in the world is that? Is it an Israelite descendant or something like that? Generosity is contagious too. And so God knows the impact that ingratitude or gratitude can have on a community. And so he takes this very seriously. I mean, this story of Numbers chapter 11 is not the first time that the Israelites complained about their food. In Exodus 16, we see it happen for the first time. I mean, the Israelites in Exodus 16 are barely out of the driveway from Egypt. And we read this in Exodus 16, verses 2 and 3. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we die by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you brought us out into this desert to starve the entire assembly to death. Do you hear what they're doing? Do you hear what's happening? This is revisionist history at its best. They act like they had it great in Egypt. They just sat around all day and ate meat. That's all they did, just sat around pots of meat like this big fondue party all the time in Egypt. It was like they gathered around this huge buffet, just ordered whatever they wanted, and that's what they ate. It was a great time, wasn't it? Yeah, except for that slavery part that they're forgetting about. That doesn't even come up. They see all these things, but they forget about the, the slavery part. And that brings us to another important aspect of complaining, and that is complaining always creates complaints. Creating all, complaining always creates complaints. It not only spreads from person to person, but it gives you more personally to complain about. Have you ever found that to be true? I mean, the Israelites get into this, and they're whining, and they're grumbling, and complaining, and the more they do it, the more they do it. They start making things up, things that aren't even true. But they're complaining about them. They look only at the food that they had in Egypt and they completely forget about the slavery that they had for 400 years that was so bad that they cried out to God for a deliverer. Now they're barely free and they're already griping about it. And so God finally gets to the point where he's had enough. He's sick of it. He's heard enough of the criticism. And here's what God says to the people of Israel through Moses. Look at verses 18 through 20 of Numbers chapter 11. Moses says, Consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you wailed, if only we had meat to eat. Now the Lord will give you meat and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day or two days or five or ten or twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your mouth and nostrils and you loathe it. I'm going to give meat to eat for a month. So much of it is going to come out of your nostrils. Vomit out. You want me? God says. I'll give you me. You going to cry? I'll give you something to cry about. God says. You're going to eat meat until it's coming out of your nostrils. Because you've been complaining about not having meat. I'm going to give you a bunch of it. And so God's going to teach his people a really important lesson here when it comes to being grateful and content, being thankful people. But here's the thing about complaining. Complaining almost always lacks perspective. Complaining almost always lacks perspective. What we are missing in the midst of our negative attitude of complaining and whining is perspective. We lose perspective. Instead of focusing on what is good, instead of focusing on the grace of God in our lives, we get fixated on the things that we don't have or the things that someone else has that we don't and we would like. I heard recently about a teacher who asked her classroom students to do a simple assignment. Just write down, she said, write down a few things that you're thankful for. 
And one little boy wrote this. I love his attitude. He said, I'm grateful for my glasses because they keep the boys from hitting me and the girls from kissing me. <laughs> grateful for my glasses. They keep the boys from hitting me and the girls from kissing me. Good perspective. He's grateful and he's not grateful. A lot of us, we just lose perspective. And we forget a lot of times about how much, how much we have been blessed. We find ourselves complaining about the meat not being tender enough. And we forget about the fact that we've got this abundance of food on the table. My mom called me in the middle of writing this particular part of the message. And it was on Monday afternoon. And she called me from the Florence Mall. She and my niece were out shopping at the Florence Mall. And they were asking me about different questions about gifts for Addie and for Stacy. And mom said to me, you can't even eat in the food court here because of the governor's restrictions. And I said to her, that's so stupid. That place is so wide open. Nobody's got the virus there. And totally forget the fact that she can get food there. She just has to take it somewhere else and eat it. Totally forget the fact she's got enough money to buy however many meals she wants to buy there. She's got enough money to be able to go Christmas shopping with her niece, something that they love to do. Forget that she can get in the car and go to some other restaurant and go through the drive through and get something to eat. Forget that you can go just a few miles across the river to a different state where there are no restrictions and eat inside of a restaurant. We totally, totally lose perspective. Easy to lose perspective when you complain. Easy to focus on the minutia of what you don't have. And you forget about everything that you do have. I think that's why when you talk to people who are who have been outside the United States, specifically they've been in a third world country, they come back with a completely different perspective that has dramatically changed because they realize just how, just how much we have to be thankful for. So God reaches this point with the Israelites where he's had enough of the wine. In fact, when you look in Psalm chapter 106, King David writes about this specific moment. In Israel's history, listen to what he says in verse 25. Speaking of the Israelites, he said, They grumbled in their tents, and they did not obey the Lord. Here's what he means by that, the context of that. It means they would go to the tabernacle and worship and praise God, and they would come back home to their tents and complain about the God that they just worshipped. God's had enough of them. Look at Numbers chapter 14, starting in verse 26. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community, that's what he thinks about the morning. How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I've heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites, so you tell them, As sure as I live, declares the Lord, I will do you the very things I heard you say. In this desert, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and has grumbled against me. See, a lot of us don't realize that this is why the Israelites took 40 years to make a trip that should have been less than a month in length. Because God is waiting for this generation of wicked complainers to die off. So that he can accomplish what he wants to accomplish with his people. God's just waiting. He's waiting for the complainers to die. He's waiting for the nitpickers to breathe their last. So that he can fulfill the promise that he made to his people years before. And this is how serious it is. God takes negativity, constant criticism, frequent fault finding. Why does it take it so seriously? Because complaining lacks perspective. It ignores what he has done for us. If you look back again at Psalm 106, where David's writing about this part of Israel's history, you'll see this in verse 7. He said, when our fathers were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. They did not remember your many Kindnesses. They didn't give any thought to your miracles. God had sent ten plagues miraculously to deliver them. They forgot about it. God parted the waters of the Red Sea miraculously. They forgot about it. God guided them every day with a pillar of cloud, every night with a pillar of fire. Completely forgot about that. God miraculously.
purposely gave them manna to eat so that their bellies would be full and they would never crave hunger. When they were thirsty, he miraculously brought water from a rock. They forgot about it. The theme of his people here is complaining. Sun's too hot, journey's too long, food's too bland, we're sick of it. They've lost perspective completely. Listen, God has been so good to us. And the reason this is such a serious sin, specifically for Christians, is the last thing I want to point out to you, and that is that complaining undermines the message of the gospel. Complaining undermines the message of the gospel. We are to be a light that shines in a dark world, but complaining undermines that purpose. We, as Christians living in 21st century America, should be the most content, thankful, grateful people because of the gospel. Because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, taking our punishment. And so when we are complainers, when we are whiners, it undermines that message of the gospel. And so when God provides for us so generously and sacrificially, and yet we start our day off complaining about a job that we don't like. Or kids who are rarely on time. Or about the new wrinkles that we see when we look in the mirror. About the teacher or the coach who just doesn't get it. About the in-laws who stay longer than they should. When we start each day complaining, here's what that's like. It's like God holding up the waters of the Red Sea and his people walking through and looking at their feet and complaining about the mud between their toes. That's what it's like. That's the image. Folks, we have been saved from our sins and from death. We've been given grace and forgiveness through Jesus. We were slaves to sin, but he rescued us. He delivered us. He made himself nothing. He died for us on a cross. And in the light of his goodness and grace, our prayer should be, Father, forgive me. Forgive me for not being back. Forgive me of my complaining, losing perspective, and forgetting how good he was. Forgive me for whining and undermining the message of the gospel in my life. And so on this weekend after Thanksgiving, maybe that's a prayer that we all need to pray. Maybe like me, you've never really thought much about complaining and whining as being something that needs to be repented of, but it's a sin. It is a grievous sin that is offensive to God. He takes it personally as a father who generously provides. And so maybe a challenge for all of us between now and Christmas Day is to keep a gratitude journal. I'm going to try this myself because I need to improve in this area greatly. But just one time a day between now and Christmas, reflect on your life and on the day you just had, and just write down five things that you're thankful for every day between now and Christmas. If we all do that, by the time we get to Christmas, starting today, if we do that, we will have each of us 135 different things that we're thankful for. I think that invites the blessing of God into our lives in some unique ways when we are intentional to take notice and to be grateful, to get rid of the thanksgiving feet of envy, and to simply say, Father, thank you for everything. You have given us everything. You are everything. And Father, we thank you that not only do we have salvation from our sins, grace that's amazing, the gift of your Holy Spirit to live within us, the promise of life eternal in heaven, Father, we as 21st century American Christians have got everything else to boot. We have it so good here. Forgive us for complaining. Forgive us for nitpicking. Forgive us for whining and always finding fault. 
And Father, help us to focus on you. You are a good, good Father. And just help us to always remember that and to record everything that we are grateful for, whether that's mentally or on a piece of paper or in our hearts, just to, Father, we thank you. We thank you more than anything for this gift of salvation that comes through your Son. And for somebody here today that needs to make that decision to give their life to Jesus for the very first time, I pray during this song of invitation that they would do just that. We pray all these things in His name. Amen. Let's stand today and sing our song of invitation.